Welcome to the lecture on religion in the cultural landscape. This is for AP Human Geography, uh, chapter 7, the chapter on religion. This entire lecture is going to be focused on how religion is seen in the cultural landscape and the type of impact that religion has on the cultural landscape. There are four aspects of how religion impacts the cultural landscape that we're going to examine in this lecture, and those four aspects are sacred sites, burial sites and rituals, architecture, and place names. Let's go ahead and get started with sacred sites. In this picture, this is an introductory slide, and in this picture we can see um, depicted Ayers Rock, uh, also known as Uhuru, located in Australia. Now this is a sacred site for the Aboriginal people of Australia. However, this is not the cultural landscape. This is the natural landscape. So despite the fact that this is a sacred site, this is not an example of how um, religion impacts the cultural landscape. The first example of how religion impacts the cultural landscape in terms of sacred sites is the site of Mecca. So Mecca is the hearth of the Muslim religion or Islam, and it is the birthplace as well as the home of the Prophet Muhammad. And here in Mecca is the uh, located is the Great Mosque. Uh, we can see two uh, minarets uh, just in the center of our screen, those are the entrances to the mosque, and this picture is a view of inside the Great Mosque. So how does this Great Mosque and Mecca in general, how does this impact the cultural landscape? Well, it's the ongoing, through the ongoing preservation of space. So located right in the center of this photo, we see a, a building draped in a black cloth. This is known as the Kaaba, and this is a uh, it, it holds inside of it a sacred rock that was actually sacred prior to as a pre-Islamic um, site that was sacred. And so we have the ongoing preservation of this space for thousands of years at this point. We can see located all around the building in the center, the Kaaba, in the courtyard of the Great Mosque are thousands and thousands of people. Now, who are these people? These people are pilgrims. Their adherence to the Muslim religion, uh, the religion of Islam, these are Muslims, and they have traveled from all over the world to make this pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, it's one of the five pillars is to make the pilgrimage. And so this um, site has really impacted the cultural landscape in order to provide infrastructure for this pilgrimage and all of these pilgrims. The second sacred site that we're going to look at here is Jerusalem, and in particular, We'll see two slides on Jerusalem, but this is the first slide. In particular, we're looking at the building right in the center that has two blue domes and is adorned with crosses on top. So this building is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and this church is considered holy by all Christian faiths and is currently administered by both the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic faiths. So this is a site of um, prayer. It's a site of ritual. Uh, it's a site of yearly um, holidays and celebrations. Um, and this is, again, a, an example of the ongoing preservation of space. And um, it's a place where pilgrims from around the world come visit. And in, it, in addition to adherence to the religion, tourists also come um, from around the world, whether or not they are Christian adherents, to visit this sacred site as well. The next picture that we're looking at is also located in Jerusalem, and this is an example of how two sacred sites can occupy almost the same space and cause conflict. The first one that we're looking at is this golden dome, and this golden dome here is called the Dome of the Rock, and it's a mosque. So this is a sacred site for the um, religion of Islam as well, and um, this this is where... Um, the religion of Islam believes that uh, Muhammad's body, uh, soul, uh, rose to heaven from this site. So it's one of the most holy sites in all of Islam. And it's built on an area that um, used to be the location of the Jewish temple. So the most important site in Judaism. Um, the Jewish temple has been destroyed for 2,000 years, and there's only one remnant of it left, and that's right here located in the bottom right corner, uh, in, in the red circle, and that's called the Western Wall or Wailing Wall. It's the only remnant left of the original Jewish temple, and it is the most holy or most sacred site in all of 
uh, the entire Jewish religion. So we can see how there's a conflict here over space. Um, who is allowed to use this space? And the fact that these two um, sacred sites are in such close proximity, and the fact that uh, many adherents of the Jewish faith believe that they would like to tear down the Dome of the Rock Mosque and rebuild the uh, original Jewish temple, uh, while of course that is not um, an idea shared by Muslims. Um, so this creates tension over the use or conflict over the use of a specific sacred site here in Jerusalem. So now we're going to travel east to India, um, and we're visiting a city called Varanasi. Varanasi was referred to as Banaras during the time of uh, British colonization. And Varanasi is a sacred site because it's located on um, one of the holiest rivers in the Hindu religion, and that river is called the Ganges. So we can see in this picture the Ganges River, and we can see a series of stairs that were built. Um, and so this, again, shows us the ongoing preservation of space, and it shows us, uh, we can see the people in the, um, in the background here are, again, pilgrims who have um, visited this sacred site in order to um, bathe in the water of the Ganges, in order to make sacrifices, in order to perform rituals, uh, in, in order to be cleansed. Uh, this picture shows uh, how what it looks like on specific days that are um, holy in the religion of Hinduism. And um, on these days, we have thousands and thousands of people come to the banks of the Ganges River here in Varanasi in order to do their um, prayers and do their rituals. So we can see a huge impact on the cultural landscape here um, with the influx of pilgrims. Um, now we're moving a, a little bit north, and we are visiting uh, Bodh Gaya. Now Bodh Gaya is also located in India, uh, and Bodh Gaya is a sacred site for um Pilgrims in the Buddhist religion is one of many sacred sites in the Buddhist religion, but it's the only one that we're going to talk about. Um, here we can see a temple, and uh, here we can see an offering uh, under a, a, a Bodhi tree, a sacred tree uh, for the Buddhist religion. And this site is sacred because it's believed um, that this is where the uh, historical Buddha, uh, Gautama Siddhartha, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, where he... Um, achieved enlightenment, attained enlightenment. So again, um, thousands of uh, Buddhist pilgrims visit this site every year to um, do rituals um, and to pray. Um, also, the um, Dalai Lama, the um, a leading figure of Tibetan Buddhism, he does a yearly teaching at this site, uh, which attracts, again, thousands of uh, followers. Okay, we're going to move on to the next topic in the lecture, um, Religion and the Cultural Landscape. So this topic is um, burial sites, and burial sites and burial rituals have a huge impact on the cultural landscape. The picture that's starting off this section, uh, burial sites, uh, I actually took this photograph last summer on my trip to Croatia, and this is a um, graveyard. Uh, obviously, um, the people who uh, are occupying this graveyard, the people who are deceased, um, died in the conflict. Um, in 1991, the conflict with Serbia, um, and this is a um, this is a Christian, obviously, but this is specifically a Catholic um, cemetery. So we can see how this imposes sort of a uniformity on the landscape. Um, it really does change the landscape. Uh, it requires uh, cemeteries require quite a bit of local land um, to be used, so it affects how local land is used, um, and it also makes the landscape very distinctive. For Christian cemeteries, as and we're going to find out, um, also for um, uh, Islamic cemeteries and Jewish cemeteries, uh, the aesthetic um, that they try to achieve is sort of a park-like aesthetic. So um, really, these cemeteries are modeled on a park-like structure. There's a lot of grass, there's trees, um, and then there's also, of course, uh, markers uh, to indicate uh, a memorial for each individual um, person who has deceased. So we're going to compare this Christian cemetery here to a Muslim cemetery. And this Muslim cemetery is actually f uh, located in Calgary. It's not a place I've ever been. It's a, just a photograph that I got off the internet. But um, this Muslim cemetery is very similar. We can see trees. We can see grass. We can see a lot of land being used. We can see a uniform landscape. And we can see um, markers or gravestones marking uh, individual um, people who have uh, deceased. So here's an, yet another um, Muslim cemetery, and we can see very similar. We have plants, uh, we have grave markers, we have a uniform landscape. 
Uh, we have a lot of land usage, and we're going to compare that again to a Jewish cemetery and all the same uh, elements that we saw in the previous two uh, of the major monotheistic religions. Uh, we can see how there's a uniformity of the landscape. We can see how there's a, a large impact in terms of local land use, and we can see how it really does make the landscape very distinctive. So now we're going to move um, to a burial site and burial ritual, and that's the um, ritual of cremation. So in the uh, Hinduism, or in the Hindu religion, um, cremation is, a, is very common. It's not uh, universally practiced, not 100% of the time, but um, it is very common. And um, in cremation, first, uh, you know, funeral rites are observed, and then the bodies are burned. And so here we can see a body wrapped in a uh, cloth that is being brought down to an area, a funeral pyre, to be burned. And then the remains or the ashes will be scattered into the Ganges River. So this, again, is a, a use of the Ganges River. Um, this, this actual uh, cremation location is, is very close to the earlier photograph that we saw. And we can see actually how this affects local land use as well. We can see how um, the chopping down of trees is necessary um, in order to uh, burn, burn the deceased. And uh, we can see how it really does make the landscape distinctive. Um, so all of that is true um, for Buddhism, Buddhism as well. Again, in Buddhism, cremation is quite common. It's not universally practiced, but it is common. Um, and here is a picture of um, a Buddhist cremation ceremony where the Tibetan monks are burning a deceased monk. So the final type of um, burial site that, and burial practice that we're going to look at that has a very large impact on the cultural landscape are burial mounds. So burial mounds are, are typical of uh, animistic or shamanistic religions. So these are pre-Christian, uh, pre-monotheistic religions. Uh, and we can actually observe these burial mounds all around the world. These, this picture right here is, uh, these were burial mounds created in Europe. Uh, and I believe these are uh, created by Celtic people in the uh, British Isles. So that's a pre-Christian pre um, tradition that was uh, abandoned once Christianity diffused uh, to this part of the world. And here we can see uh, Indian burial mounds. So this is in North America. This is in sp specifically this is in Minnesota. And uh, these mounds, um, they're marked here by a historical marker. But these are uh, these are over 1,500 years old. So um, this is a tradition that dates back to prior to European contact um, for the Na Native American Indians um, who occupied this region and practiced what we would refer to as uh, shamanistic or animistic religions. So we can see how the these burial mounds um, really make the landscape dis distinctive and they uh, also affect local land use. Um, and this is yet another example of how religion has a large impact on the cultural landscape. So the next topic uh, in this lecture is how um, religion is seen in the cultural landscape in terms of architecture. So specifically we're looking at how um, special buildings are designed and used for worship and meditation and spiritual functions and it really sh uh, we're really going to look at how um, these buildings um, create uh, really distinctive landscapes that represent the uh, religion and represent the religious history they also um, restrict, in certain cases, um, the use of land in the surrounding area, and in some cases they attract tourists, and in all cases they attract pilgrims. So let's take a, a quick journey through the um, architecture of the religious uh, landscape. So we're looking here at places of worship. So an example of a place of worship would be a Buddhist temple. Um, this is a very distinctive style of Buddhist temple. This is from a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Um, so we can see here how really the um, uniqueness of the landscape is created, um, how the history is respected, um, and we see really a regional um, version of Buddhism here, which is very interesting because in, an, in another um, Buddhist temple located uh, here in Bodh Gaya, India, we can see how it's very different, um, but also um, very distinct. So um, two, two very um, different and distinct um, Buddhist temples with similar function, similar use, um, and another, yet another um, Buddhist temple here, and this is the uh, Norbulinka, the winter palace of the Dalai Lama, um, located in Tibet. Obviously, he's not there anymore because he's uh, 
uh, been banished from Tibet. But um, this is another example of a, a very distinctive cultural landscape uh, demonstrating the uh, religious history uh, here as a place of worship. So moving on, we're going to look at some Hindu temples. And um, another, similar to Buddhism, the Hindu temples have um, a very regional uh, distinctiveness. So from one part of India to, to another part, uh, you're going to see temples with very different um, looks and different styles to them. But however, their, their function in the cultural landscape and how they shape or change the cultural landscape uh, is the same. So we can see how it's making the landscape distinctive, and we can see how it is uh, really using a lot of the space around it, um, and also how this uh, and the, these temples especially attract uh, large numbers of tourists. Um, so here's uh, more examples of Hindu temples. This is a temple from the south, uh, where the temples are uh, carved with um, thousands of uh, uh, thousands of um, deities and in full color. Um, so this is a distinctive temple in the southern part of India. Okay, moving on, we're going to look at some uh, mosques. So mosques are obviously the sites of worship for the um, the religion of Islam or Muslim people. Um, and this particular mosque is called the Mosque of Suleiman. So this is located in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. And um, this mosque uh, demonstrates uh, two very... Uh, distinct features that nearly all moths, mosques have, um, which are the dome, you can see right here, and then the minaret. So despite the fact that around the world mosques look different, um, they they all have these distinctive features of the dome and the minaret. The uh, minaret obviously very important in the call to prayer. So um, as we look around the world, um, like in Hinduism or Buddhism, we see a, a variety of different styles in architecture. Um, uh, here's a here's another example of a mosque located in the Middle East. Um, here's a, a mosque located in Iran, so that would be more of Central Asia, and this is called the Blue Mosque located in Iran, and we can see how it, it takes up a lot of space, um, so really the, the surrounding area is affected, and we can see how it makes the landscape very distinct and unique, represents the religious history, and also uh, in some cases attracts large amounts of tourists. So moving on uh, for Christianity, um, this is the uh, Vatican Church, uh, located obviously in Vatican City. It's the the holiest um, site in the um, the religion of uh, Roman Catholicism, um, and we can see here uh, it has a, its own unique and distinctive style. Um, here is a Catholic church located in Brazil, and we can find Catholic churches with their um, the spires. So we can see here. Um, both of these have unique spires, uh, and these are um, distinctive of Catholic churches all around the world. So other Christian churches have um, similar but uh, not but unique architecture in and of themselves. So we have a Lutheran church here. Uh, this is located in North America, and we can see this uh, Baptist church here. So what they have in common, again, is making the landscape distinctive, um, land usage around the place of worship, uh, and then also attracting tourists. Um, here is a synagogue, so it's similar to um, basically all of the other structures that we've seen. So synagogue being the most important um, building in the Jewish religion. And this will be the last one we see. This is a, a European synagogue built uh, about 250, 300 years ago. So the final aspect of how religion is seen in the cultural landscape is through place names. And uh, we happen to live in a place that is named because of religious purposes. So the, um, the thing about naming uh, or placing a religious toponym on a place is... So the way that place names impact the cultural landscape is through promoting regional distinctiveness, and also confirming the importance of religion in everyday life. So when we see names like San Francisco, which is named for the Catholic Saint, Saint Francis, uh, or uh, Saint Francis de Assisi, um, we can see how the people who place that name, and in this case it was uh, Spanish explorers or conquistadores, they um, were really confirming how important religion was to them. 
and that's why they use this toponym, uh, St. Francis. So we can see also Islamabad, Pakistan is another example. So this is obviously named after the religion of Islam, Pakistan identifying itself as a, uh, as a Muslim country. So Islamabad, again, confirms the importance of religion in everyday life and promotes regional distinctiveness. San Diego is another example. This is very similar to San Francisco, a uh, name bestowed by the um, first uh, Spanish explorers. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota is similar to San Francisco and San Diego. This is a Catholic um, this is a Catholic saint, um, <clears throat> but uh, as opposed to being uh, uh, named by Spanish explorers, this was uh, this name was placed by later uh, Western European explorers, uh, Saint Paul, uh, and we have Saint Paul of South America, which is Sao Paulo. Uh, it's also named for Saint Paul, and that's found in Brazil. So we can see through all of these examples how um, use of um, religiously inspired toponyms promotes regional distinctiveness and confirms the importance of religion in everyday life. So this concludes the lecture on religion in the cultural landscape.